This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. On Thursdays mor Thursday mornings, I go down and have coffee at Cozy Corner at 6 a.m. A bunch of guys go down there every day of the week. I can't drag myself out of the house quite that early. But once a week, I go down there. And uh, we, we, we drink coffee and discuss. Men do not gossip, they discuss. So we discuss. And in, in the background, as you know, there's a big flat screens, right? And it's always on the 24-hour news program, which means we are never more than five minutes away from hearing about either Clinton, Cruz, Trump, Rubio, Bush, Sanders, or any of the others that I did not name. And each of these people are discussed and vetted, and, and as is um, my habit, my practice, Neither over coffee nor in the pulpit do I ever uh, say anything about individual politicians. It just works better that way. I regard that as a basic expectation that a church can have of its pastor not to uh, weigh in on how people should vote. Having said that, that has not always been the case. If you look back across the scope of history, how church and state have related to each other over the, the history of this nation, it has shifted over time. Right? And we assume that how things are today is how things have always been, and that's not the case. If we go back to the first days, the decades after the Revolutionary War, the way the church and the state related is the church saw itself as converting the nation. As the nation expanded westward, if you wanted to go west, the, the government would give you 40 acres and you went out and you, by farming it, it became yours. So you went out west and you farmed it, it was your land now, and the church was right behind all the people in the, the wagons and, and everywhere you could get a couple people together, they'd pitch a tent, have a, a revival, and that was what, how the nation uh, became a nation of Christians. The, 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 uh, as people headed west, the, the church went with them. So we have uh, the church was converting the nation. Then the Civil War struck, and that was rather ugly. If, if you look at the percentage of people that died, uh, and the same percentage of people died in a war today, if we had a war today, uh, it'd be like the state of Missouri dying. I mean, it was a huge, catastrophic war. And in this war, uh, the church saw itself as praying for the victor. Now, obviously, half the churches were wrong, uh, but they saw themselves as praying for the victor. And that happened here in Milan. Uh, you may or may not know, this is the Methodist Church South. The, the red brick one down, that's south of us, that's the Methodist Church North. So the north is south of the south. Uh, makes perfect sense. Um, but that's what happened during the Civil War. After that, it was, so it was the church was praying for the victor. After that, we get the, the time of the Industrial Revolution, of the steam engine, uh, of everyone moving in mass to the cities. And the church saw itself as reforming the nation. And there was a real need for reform. Because what was happening, uh, people were, 12 year olds were working seven day weeks, 12 hour days, right? So the pressure was, the church was pushing this reform movement to invent the weekend, to invent high school. High school was invented as a way to keep 14 year olds out of the factories. So you couldn't be sent to work till you were at least 18. And so, it, and also temperance was part of this as well, uh, because everyone going to the cities for the first time and you go from a farm uh, way of living where you never have cash to the city and you get paid in cash and all these fellows who would leave the factory, they would, uh, with their cash, they would go hit the bars, they would hook up with the bar prostitutes, and then they'd bring uh, syphilis home to their wives. It was called secondhand syphilis. And so temperance, yes, that was a very good idea. It may not have been executed well, but uh, if wives today started getting secondhand syphilis, you know something would change about that too, right? So that was this time where the church was reforming the nation, this great pressure to change how things were working. And that was a good thing. And then uh, we move ahead a little bit. We get to the post-World War II. The church was sort of the conscience of the nation during the, the fight against the godless communists and that whole Cold War thing. Um, and then we hit today. What is the role of the church with regards to the state today? It was church converting the nation, church praying for the victor, you have church reforming the nation, and you have church sort of being the conscience of the nation. What is the relationship between church and state today? Right? That's the, that's the answer. Blank stare. Huh? 
Exactly. That's the challenge. We are floundering over this last generation or so. The pressures of modern life are contributing to this. We are in a time when more people move every year than ever before, and so they're moving to be, and when you move, people are landing to live with people who are more like them. You can look, it's called the big sort. People are sorting themselves across the nation, and so our politics is getting far more polarized as local districts are, are becoming far more liberal or conservative in either direction. And so uh, families are under more stress to stay together, the economic pressures are high, and, and the cohesion of the American culture is degrading. Uh, and you want an example of that? Besides the Super Bowl and Christmas, what other thing does every American take part in? Exactly, right? That, that, that's the challenge. Like, what else binds us together as a people? And so, this impacts the church as well. We, we have, we have, we're lacking consensus on these big questions. And as the, the role of the church has, has shifted, I believe we have entered a time when we need to be discerning. What does it mean to be the church in America? What's the role of the church with regards to the state? Because it has shifted, it has changed. Now there is an individual in the scriptures who we turn to when we need to discern how to handle a local a change in context. There's a fellow in the, who writes many of the letters in the New Testament. And what he does again and again is he'll write a letter to Rome and say, I have advice for you in this context. But then he'll write a letter to, Corinthian, to the church at Corinth and say, but I have different advice for you. And I have different advice for you over here at Philippi. If you ever read the letters of Paul, that's who I'm speaking of, and you think Paul's disagreeing with himself, well, maybe not. Maybe he's giving different advice for different situations. And we call that wisdom, right? And so we turn to Paul today to seek some guidance on how church and state might relate. Now, if you go and you talk to folks about uh, who've studied scripture, and you ask, well, what does Paul have to say about church and state? What you'll often find people pointing to is Romans 13, this, this, the magisterial letter Paul writes to the church at Rome, this big letter laying out his sort of grand thesis of, of what, how, what he believes. And, and in the middle of it, we have this piece where Paul starts out. It's in Romans 12. He, he uses this amazing phrase. It's always caught my attention. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might discern what is good. What is holy? What is God's will? Right, this is a grand charge he makes to them. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is God's will for the situation in which you find yourself. And he starts to lay out what this looks like, and he starts small. He says, at the individual level, Romans 12, the first couple verses, he says, be humble. Do not think of yourself as any higher than anyone else. At the individual level, as you are discerning and being transformed, be humble. And then he moves on to a slightly larger context, the context of the church. And he says to the church, now church, for you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind means that you see each other as fellow members of the body of Christ. You're in this together. That you agree that you will not overcome evil with evil, but you will overcome evil with good. And he explains a little bit more about this. So he's He's explained, be transformed at the individual level, at the level of the church. And then we get to Romans 13. And now he talks about what you should do at the level of the state. And he says to them, don't mess with the state. They've got the sword. They'll kill you. Right? They'll get you. Why does he say this? Why does this make sense? Why does he completely ditch all this talk of being transformed? you got to look at the context. And the context is this. In the year 49 AD, the Emperor Octavian evicted every single follower of Crestus. He, he misspelled Christ. He spelled it with an E instead of an I. He evicted every single follower of Crestus from the city. If you follow Jesus, you are kicked out. You lost all your property. You were a goner. Right? Because you were viewed, Octavian viewed the Christians as rabble rousers and stirring the pot. They were used as scapegoats. If you want to get into Roman politics, it's very intriguing. But the long and short of it is, from the year 49 to the year 54 AD, 54 AD, for five years there, every single follower of Jesus was kicked out of the city. And then they're allowed to come back in in 54 AD because Octavian has died and the next Caesar has come to power. And so they come back, and so they're putting their lives back together. Right? And you remember, this is an, if you got kicked out of your house today and you had to move to another city, you know what you'd still have? your bank account, right? But this isn't a time before digital banking. Like, they got kicked out and they lost everything. And so they come back to the city and they're putting their lives back together. 
and, and this is in the mid-50s, and that's when Paul writes the letter to him. Right? And so it's actually very wise advice. If you're in a situation where you have no political power, where you are under the threat of being evicted and losing everything you have, for Paul to look at you and say, keep your head down, don't mess with them, don't touch it, don't think about it, don't look at them too, they've got the sword, they will get you, pay your taxes, and just don't, just don't touch them, right? right? That makes perfect sense, right? When everything you own is at risk, because the state might take it all, the best advice Paul can give you is, don't mess with them, they got the sword, pay your taxes, just get along. Now, does anyone here feel like your house is in risk of being repossessed by the government because you follow Jesus? Okay. So, does, Paul advice, does Paul's advice just to do exactly what the government asks and just get along, does that really apply to us today? No. In one day it might, I hope not, but uh, it doesn't apply to us here. I think Paul, uh, and so often when people look at Romans 13 as that's the, what we should do when, when it comes to church and state relationship, I don't think that actually applies. I think Paul gives, better, gives advice that is better fitted to our community, and it's in, the, in the, his letter to the church at Philippi. They're not under risk of being evicted from their houses, and so he gives them more of a general principle. He says to them, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their goal is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it might be conformed to the body of his glory." Right. So that phrase he uses there, our citizenship is in heaven. Right. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. We are not called to be so wrapped up in this world such that we think it is, that we think that the world is everything. We are called to get focused on the, in our citizenship and the kingdom to come. As a group of people with citizenship in heaven, when we are gathered together as fellow followers of Jesus, what we end up being is sort of an outpost of heaven. You might even call us an embassy of Jesus. What we are doing here today, you can call ourselves an embassy of King Jesus. And I think that probably is the best uh, advice or the best understanding I have for the role of the church today. The church is to be an embassy of Christ, an embassy of Jesus, an embassy of how to live in a better way. Now, I don't know if it's commonly known, but if you, you, so if we have citizenship in heaven and citizenship as Americans, that makes us dual citizens. And, and the American State Department discourages this because it says that dual citizenship complicates things. And it does. It actually rather does. They're right. And I think the, the way to understand this and to keep it from getting too complicated is to understand the difference between what citizenship in heaven expects and citizenship as an American expects. As a citizen of America, what do you expect of the state? What do you expect? What do you expect your government to provide? Safety. Protection. Protection? Highways. Highways, roads, right? education, right? cops. Right? These are very utilities. I'm a big fan of being able to turn on the water. I like water. I, these are the basics that we expect of our government. We expect the, the things that are just the most humble, simple, not always easy, but the simple things. Roads, bridges, schools, police, utilities. They're good things. They're humble things. What do we expect from our citizenship as followers of Jesus? Redemption. Salvation. Holiness. Forgiveness. Right? What the state does is always temporary. Is there anything the state is going to do that's going to last forever? No. no. Is there anything that the church does that is going to last forever? Yeah. What we do here has eternal implications. What the state does, does not. Right? The state cannot make people good. Right? The state, you can't legislate people into becoming good people. The best the state can do is to say, don't be so bad. It can say, we're going to try to stop you from murdering. It's the church that can say, we're going to teach you how to love your neighbor, even if your neighbor is your enemy. Right? It's a very different type of goal. The state has a far humbler approach, a far humbler set of goals. The church has a far more exalted purpose. And this church is an outpost, an embassy of God's kingdom, the place where those goals are eternal. 
This is how I think we are to understand the church and the state. The state does its gig, trying to maintain the basics, which can sometimes be rather challenging when you're on the East Coast and you get three foot of snow. And the church does its gig, which is calling people to be transformed by following Jesus. The church, as an embassy of God's kingdom, sends out people as representatives of that as well. I mean, it's not that we don't have anything to do with each other. I wish that there were more faithful, committed, humble servants of Jesus who were serving as elected officials. I think that's a great thing when Christians are serving in positions of public office. But even as a Christian in a position of public office, the most you can work for are those very humble goals. Clean roads, utilities, right? Defense, education. I think much of our frustration comes from getting this confused when we expect the state to do more than it really should. And, then we, and there's a temptation by politicians to, to pro, over-promise, right? Well, think of the great slogans of the last decade when it comes to, you, you, they're usually these are three or four word slogans, right? Make America great or make America great again or yes we can or hope and change. What are the other ones we've heard in the last decade? Anyone else remember any of the other ones? Right. These are big, grand, make great, hope, change, all these. I don't need hope and change. Flint needs clean water. I want clean roads, right? That, that's, that's not hope and change. That's just taking care of the basics. And, and it's important to have those. To put it as directly as I can, while it is, as, it is important who is elected president in the coming months, and I hope each of you votes, let us be clear that whoever is elected, whether it be Bush, Trump, Cruz, Rubio, Rubio, Clinton, Sanders, or any of the others, it has no eternal implications. Right? Your salvation will not be affected by who the next president is. What happens here on Sunday, gathering as citizens of the kingdom of God, is more important than what happens in the ballot booth. Right? Because what happens here has eternal implications. What happens in the ballot booth, it's important. Please vote. But what happens here is more important. I think that's one of the reasons that I don't think politicians should, or po pastors should say anything about any individual politician. It's because I have something far more important to say. There's nothing more interesting I can say to you than Jesus is Lord. Nothing more important than I can say about any of the other candidates, no matter how interesting they are. Jesus is Lord is far more interesting. I believe that the church needs to be saying this, and repeatedly during this year, we are citizens of heaven, an embassy for King Jesus, empowering and transforming lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. And our citizenship as Americans, while I would not want to trade it for a citizenship in any other nation in the world, I, I value it greatly, it's important, but it is secondary. And, and so let me offer you a piece of advice as we go into this election year. We're going to see some ads, especially if you're watching anything from Iowa. God help them. Uh, you're going to see some ads. You're going to listen to ads. And, and some of them you're going, to, you're going to agree with, and some of, your, some of them you're not going to agree with. I don't agree with them all either. But you might just try saying this after you, when you're getting caught up in the dogfight, getting caught up in, in the frustration about who is going to win and all that. Just say to yourself, this is secondary. This is secondary. Jesus is most important. This, this is secondary. We are all Americans, and that is a good thing, but it is a humbler and secondary thing to being Christians, to being citizens of the kingdom of God as we gather together as an embassy for Jesus our Lord. Amen. We come together now to confess when we have fallen short of God's calling upon our lives. Please join with me as we confess with the words printed in front of us. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart.